May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Confession is said to be good for the soul, but it isn't always good for the career. At the risk of saying too much this morning, I'd like to begin by making two confessions. First, my name is Patrick, and I am an Anglo-Catholic. Hi, Patrick. <laughs> it would be the evangelical who thought he could talk back. <laughs> now, I know what you're thinking. Surprise, surprise. Who'd have thunk it? But my second confession, I think you'll find considerably more surprising. If I were completely honest, I have to admit that ordinarily, I can't stand Anglo-Catholics. <laughs> now, lest some of you begin to suspect me of cognitive dissonance, let me tell you what I mean. So many in this world who claim to be Anglo-Catholic are in reality simply individuals who enjoy wearing inordinate amounts of silk and lace while performing highly stylized musical and choreographic routines before an audience seeking to be entertained. That is to say that sociologically speaking, many Anglo-Catholics are merely drag queens who work on Sundays. <laughs> A reality that makes the aversion of some of them to our LGBTQ siblings all the more suspect, but I digress. All this is to say that I enjoy a good drag show as much as the next guy, but I can hardly parlay that into a basis for ordering my life and preparing my soul for death. In my humble, but I think correct opinion, chancel prancing doth not an Anglo-Catholic make. Instead, the true Catholic Anglican is the person whose imagination is founded in the Word, bounded by the creeds, surrounded by the church, and astounded by the Eucharist. Now, time this morning does not permit for me to unpack all of these things fully, so I'll have to give short shrift to the first three in order to spend more on number four. So hang on for just a moment. First, to have an imagination that is founded in the Word is to base your thinking about God and creation in the divine revelation that God communicated to us in very human terms. Friends, just as we really can't know other people unless they reveal themselves to us using words of their own, we can't really know God unless God does the same. My friends, however, as with any communication between parties, Sometimes we don't accurately understand what others mean by their own words. Because frankly, we hear them or read them as if they were our own. For this reason, any person whose imagination is grounded in the Word of God has to be doubly humble. Humble enough to defer to God's own words about God's self and creation while also being humble enough to understand that at every single point we can fall into the trap of reading God's own words as if they were merely ours. This leads to a second thing. To have an imagination that is bounded by the creeds is to understand that we have the privilege and responsibility to think about God for ourselves. However, we aren't free to think that we can believe anything we want to believe and still claim the name Christian. That's foolishness. Now, friends, humans were created in God's image and likeness for the purpose of having a real intellectual engagement with God and creation. Contrary to what some Christians seem to think, we were given minds in order to use them. Nevertheless, just because we think something about God or creation doesn't make our thoughts true. God in God's grace, then, and the early church in its wisdom designed the creeds to provide for us boundary markers. Boundary markers showing the, the enormous theological backyard God has given us to play in. God has given us a lot of space in which to think. 
but the space is not infinitely enormous. Therefore, the creeds provide for us the least common denominator of Christianity. As I said before, one is absolutely free to conceive and believe more that is in the creeds, but one cannot believe less and still remain a Christian. What is more, and this might get me mail on Monday, people can't be called unchristian or heretic for believing things that the creeds don't spell out. Only for not believing things that the creeds do spell out. Next, what does it mean to have an imagination grounded in the church? Well, this is to realize that well-intentioned people can come up with all sorts of goofy stuff when left at home alone with their Bibles. You've seen them do it. Now, friends, it's absolutely true that we as Christians are free to think for ourselves. But that doesn't mean that everything we think is absolutely true. The church, the body of Christ, is God's gift whereby God's people can, can discern God's truth, God's way. That is, in community. Now, we should have all learned on Trinity Sunday, I hope all of you were listening on Trinity Sunday, that God has existed from all time in community. One often forgotten aspect of our creation in God's image and likeness is the fact that we too were created by God to live, to love, and to learn in community. This means, friends, we don't have to figure out the Christian faith on our own. In fact, it's stupid to try. Each one of us has prejudices, preferences, and preconceptions that tend to skew the data we read in a self-satisfying direction. Lots of fine things in the scripture I see, most of them put there by you or by me. We as individuals and as groups need the help of people who are not like us from circumstances not like ours so that we can see that which is hidden in our blind spots. Brothers and sisters, the church is God's means of grace by which our thoughts about God and creation are tested, refined, synthesized, and corrected over time. Now this process of Christians thinking in community over time is very important. It's the reason why the church no longer reads the Bible as advocating slavery. Sometimes it takes the church a long time to figure things out. But remember the old saying that says that the mill will of the church grinds slowly but exceedingly fine. All this said, now I can proceed to the matter about which I'm most concerned today. The matter that in my mind really separates liturgical drag queens from real Anglo Catholics. For you see, a true Catholic Anglican has an imagination that is astounded by the Eucharist. What do I mean by this? Probably not what you think. Some of you have been here for quite some time and you've heard dozens of Eucharistic festival sermons. I venture to guess that many of them have focused on Christ's presence among his people. And this is, of course, a good and holy thing. The whole of scripture and indeed salvation history is a progressive unpacking of this, of what Palmer Robertson calls the Emmanuel Principle. It's the fact that all divine work in creation, redemption, and new creation can be summed up in the divine name revealed in Isaiah chapter 7, Emmanuel, God with us. Now, in calling this diocese together for the very first Eucharistic festival in 1960, Bishop Brady obviously had this idea as one in his mind. He wrote, I want this diocese to be united in its faith in the presence of our blessed Lord in the bread and wine of the altar. I want them to know him there, love him there, follow him there, to know and love and follow him everywhere. So friends, the notion, the notion of Christ's presence among his people in the Eucharist is undoubtedly a Catholic notion. Many would say that it's the principal Catholic notion. However, 
If the Eucharist does no more for our imagination than help us believe that an omnipresent God is in fact present with us, then it becomes little more than a devotional object. Bishop Brady continued in his invitation, stating, I also want this diocese to be devoted to Christ in the sacrament, that we may become devoted to one another in our love for Him. The good bishop clearly recognized an additional facet of our Eucharistic imagination. That is, if in the Eucharist we are united more and more to Christ, then consequently we also become united to everyone else who is united to Christ. In short, friends, the same imagination that helps us believe that the Spirit binds us to Jesus in the Eucharist also drives us to believe that we are being knit one to another by the same Spirit. Now, this, of course, is an amazing realization. However, if our Eucharistic imagination only gets us this far, we run the risk of degrading the Eucharist into a sacrament of self and affinity group awareness. Bishop Brady, however, seemed to understand that a Eucharistic imagination that is focused purely inwardly is defective. And it was perhaps for this reason he took the language of his invitation one step farther when he wrote, and I want this diocese to be united in its efforts to make known his presence to all people. Bishop Brady was a real Anglo Catholic. He understood that Catholic thought must also have a Catholic that is universal focus. It is not enough for the Eucharist to transform our imagination concerning who we are as individuals or as a church. It also must have an outward trajectory towards the world transforming our minds to understand that God with us is nothing less than Christ's gospel proclamation, in short, to the whole world. Now, back in the day, the way our diocese enfleshed this outward-looking aspect of the Eucharistic imagination was by taking Jesus on a walk through the neighborhood as a means of bearing witness to Christ's presence among his people. Contrary to what an Ashoda House chaplain once told me, and this guy was a drag queen, um, the Eucharistic Festival was never just about a mass, a hot dog social, and a parade. The festival culminated as it did with a triumphant procession as a way of bearing Christ into the world to testify in the words of the great Abraham Kuyper that there's not a square inch in the whole domain of human existence over which Christ does not cry, Mine. Now, many years and not a few parades later, here we sit again, gathered once more to have our imaginations astounded by the Eucharist. And we have to ask ourselves the question, what might this mean for us today? Well, friends, I have no particular aversion to parades, but I fear that over time, even that devotional act, once significant for the people of Fond du Lac, might have gradually devolved a bit, well, into a drag show. Today, Christ may be calling us to develop our Eucharistic imaginations in an entirely different direction. So in the couple of minutes that I have left, allow me to posit just one possibility. All of you, I'm sure, have heard the story of the young vicar who decided to hold an evangelism workshop at his parish. And as he was giving his spiel, one of the, patri one of the parish's matriarchs, conveniently seated at the back of the room, was heard to quit. I don't know why the hell we're talking about evangelism. Everyone who really ought to be here is already here. Now, some of you giggle, but those of us in this business know that that's not a joke. In fact, the only reason many Episcopalians would even consider evangelism would be to get more people in in order to raise more money so that they could keep doing things the way that they've always done them. Now, in my line of work, however, we have a technical term for that sort of evangelism. And that word is exploitation. As a correction to that mindset, perhaps we as the Diocese of Fond du Lac should consider cultivating our Eucharistic imagination evangelistically. 
What if instead of viewing evangelism as a means of meeting our own ends, we concerned ourselves primarily with doing so for God's purposes? That is, proclaiming to the world that God is with us all in Christ. What if the realization that, come, that God comes to be with us in the ordinariness of bread and wine helped us dare to believe that God is able to share His presence with others through ordinary people like us? What is more, what if the very imagination that enables us to believe that God can transform a stale cracker into the embodiment of Christ's presence was strengthened to help us believe that he could do the same with a bum, with a drug addict, with an actual drag queen, or even a Democrat or Republican, pick your poison. In the next, in a few moments, we as a diocesan family will approach this altar rail as we have many times before. The bishop or canon Esky will deliver a host into your hand, look at you in the eye, and say, the body of Christ. In that moment, you must ask yourself, are these just empty words, or do I believe them to be true? And if the latter is the case, friends, what other seeming impossibilities might God enable you to believe about yourself, about your church, about neighbors. One can only imagine.